the wagon wheel in Saloha? Everybody started getting so bitchy about it. We are live. Welcome. Today is Tuesday, October the 2nd. We're into October 2018. This is the Picking County Board of County Commissioners work session agenda. We are starting our day with a presentation on broadband update. So, Kara, would you please introduce yourself to the public and anyone you have with you today? I'm the VP of Colorado Operations for Mammoth Networks. I've talked to you guys in the past. And I have with me uh, Andrew Eubank, who's a uh, broadband development project manager, who will be working on this project as Does well. Does Andrew want to come to the table in case we have questions? Uh, I think Evan would be better suited. OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to be watching you over there. All right, Kara, take it away. Um, OK, so we are here today. We've been working diligently with Mammoth Networks since, I guess, last summer, last fall, um, to look at what it takes to make this broad Pitkin County Broadband Initiative, PCBI as we're affectionately calling it, um, off the ground. And so just a reminder, these are the goals and objectives that we have been working on for the past few years um, to get broadband into the rural areas of Pitkin County, leveraging existing infrastructure, creating affordable, abundant, redundant, and resilient network. Um, Again, just a high overview, remind, or high overview of the project is that we would have 
um, backhaul fiber backhaul that would feed a microwave middle mile network using all of our translator sites. Uh, mountaintop sites with a four gig microwave redundant loop and from those towers we would have then last mile access points that would feed the individual household. So as the design has been evolving over the years, uh, looking back there's been quite a few different iterations but um, in concert with our partnership with uh, Garfield County on the DOLA grant we received, this is the latest and greatest design. It looks like some weaving lines, which it is, but at its core is we've basically created a figure A redundant microwave backhaul loop, which basically means if anything gets cut in a circle, it can then go back a different way and we can still get out of the valley. So when a fiber line is cut in, say, uh, the Carbondale area. <laughs> oh, just uh, recently. Just well, let's say a backhoe. <laughs> <laughs> or a utility pole that under this we would have two different um, variations of a fiber line. So, uh, for example, a CenturyLink or a Comcast that would feed into different areas. And if one went down, then we could reroute traffic out a different way. And once we work uh, with... Garfield County, we will also be able to leverage sunlight and lookout to provide multiple pathways out of Glenwood Springs, which is really the kind of key crux of um, the pinch point of any of these networks that we're designing. So this map is a little tough to read, so I apologize, but what this shows is what we've been working on under this blueprint project is really what does the coverage look like? How would we deploy services from each of these communication sites? And as we phase it based on um, potential homeowners of interest, prioritizing some of the rural areas, readiness to go, what does it look like when we actually um, get the primary sites up and running? And so this is the map that shows the purple is phase one. This is essentially what we talked to you guys about last week uh, with the budget supplemental, which would be deploying services from Crown, Williams, and Elephant Mountain. Phase two is pretty aggressive, um, but that would have, um, we can go into a little, oh. So phase two would have sunlight being active so the ta the site itself for sunlight is ready to go but given the revenue share back and some of those residences being in Garfield County we won't deploy services from sunlight until we work through that revenue and organizational structure with Garfield County but we anticipate being able to deploy services from sunlight in 2019 um, building Rudai in 2019 building Jackrabbit, I should say redeveloping Jackrabbit in 2019, as well as Thomasville, and then uh, identifying two different tertiary tower locations and drainages that would feed off of those sites that are up, that we anticipate to be up and running. And then 2013, we have scheduled Lower Red to be redeveloped and then tertiary towers off of that. So um, do we have locations for those towers? We have general ideas of those towers, but we don't have specific locations yet. So we know that we're looking at a tower around the Redstone area, a tower in Old Snowmass area that can look to Williams. Um, Castle Creek. Castle Creek area. And, uh, by, by, uh, by the frying pan? Um, so we, do, in doing the coverage, Thomasville, the existing Thomasville translator site will actually cover that area so we can leverage that existing site and that will fill most of the upper frying pan area. Wow, that's great. Oh, so, so when, you, when you note these two, uh, these two different sets of uh, towers, they're not, they're not uh, uh, connected to a specific site? Correct, those are new sites that are to be identified. New sites to be identified, okay. And those are much smaller scale sites, so it could be on a private landowner's property. We are looking at maybe using the old snowmass, um, or sorry, the basalt fire district's um, location in old snowmass area. So those are much smaller sites, but because we have Thomasville and Jackrabbit that already need to be upgraded because of the translator, we can leverage that as 
quote unquote these secondary tertiary sites? Yeah, these, these secondary sites would be broadband only as opposed to the primary sites that are, are doing things with you know, public safety as well as uh, TV translator services. So much smaller in scope. I have a question on the service area assets map. Uh, maybe I've missed it in the past, but we have a fiber backhaul to Denver going up over Independence. Oh, is no, that new? Sorry, it's just a visual. It's oh. go. It's going. It's going to Denver. Okay. Through. Okay. Oh, the the valley. Valley. Was spring. I just My, had to we're show running cable. We're doing fiber up the pass. When did that come Thank up? You. It's yeah, just the illustrative. It's a different path to get back to Glenwood than okay. going through the Glenwood Media Center. Okay. So, so it's not. It's not right next to the other. Cable. It's it's as much differentiation as we can currently get in the valley. So oh, one's it. aerial and one's within the Rio Grande area. Okay. Rachel, my lights on. Good. Yay. <laughs> um, uh, I just admire the work you've done on this, all of you, so much. And you know, I thinking back to the vote we had. I didn't realize it would take so long, um, but it, it has taken so long because we haven't asked for new money from our public, and we've been fortunate to receive some state grants that are really advancing us, and your partnerships you've created have been huge. Um, the bigger question to me in this presentation is the uh, should we advance general fund dollars to move the implementation up? And I can only see that as a positive, but I wanted to ask, do we have a projection of how many years it would take the translator fund to repay the general fund from that? Mm -hmm. um, great question, Rachel. Evan actually pointed that one piece out in the presentation. So we have modeled a couple different scenarios, and Evan might be more equipped to discuss, but we've looked at um, no greater than a 10-year payback, um, potentially a five-year, but it's really dependent on how those subscribers come on board. So. We're falling within the um, seven-year payback period. Yeah. So <laughs> what we've modeled um, at this point, um, pending your direction today, of course, in the uh, proposed 2019 budget, which you'll be seeing next week, is a seven-year payback. Okay. Thank you. And are you, John, comfortable with that as our manager that the general fund can support that? Yeah, and there's going to be there's going to be a big discussion, and I think a, a policy discussion for the board because there's still a lot of capital projects. So we're still drawing on fund balance uh, to finish the old courthouse for this project um, to continue our road maintenance program. So while we um, are are in a position where our fund balance is level and growing that we're not using fund balance for operations we're using it for capital so that makes me comfortable if we we're using it for operations i would be uncomfortable um, but there's going to be a conversation for the board about what level of fund balance you want to maintain now there's a couple of options uh, on the table you know we can either draw down the fund balance um, we can look at financing some of the other improvements, like the, the courthouse improvement, like we did with this facility. Um, you know, or you look at, do you want to slow things down? But in, in that case, you're probably looking at five to seven years to finish this build out for the, for the broadband. You know, if I, just to follow up. Um, the short answer, though, is yes. Any of those <laughs> options, I'd be comfortable. Okay. Thank you for the short answer. Yep. Um, I, I, and the long answer. Um, it seems to me that we're really going to have to um, reassess after the November election, mm -hmm. simply put. Um, it, no you know, it, it, whether the Healthy Community Fund is renewed and we have the existing support continuing to go to our senior center, our public health, our community health services, things like that uh, is, is essential. Whether the state Proposition 110 passes and we have new monies that we would know go into our road and bridge department. Mm -hmm. and potentials like that. So um, I'm willing to support this going forward now, but knowing for all of us that we have to reassess uh, after we see how things shake out in November. I think that's true, Rachel, of our entire budget. Yes, at, at this point, entire we're, <laughs> we're going to be making assumptions, but it will be dependent. We have a lot of unknowns right now on the revenue side. Talk, talking about our assumptions, just going back to our, our initial assumptions regarding the broadband, I wanted to ask if it's still appropriate uh, as broadband is, is evolving 
um, is seventy dollars a month still a reasonable ask? And is it is it a, should it be a hundred? Should it be sixty? I don't know. But that's a question I wanted to bring up because we've discussed seventy dollars a month for long enough now that maybe that number has changed. I also want to ask about twenty-five megabyte per second download and three up. Is is this going to be broadband that's going to be appropriate, or are we going to feel that it's undersized and in, in you know not not what not optimal very shortly? You know, just the way things are going, and you probably have a better idea of that. So those are a couple of the assumptions. Uh, thanks for clearing up the, the past. I was thinking, wait a minute, there's not they're not running fiber over in Penn's <laughs> Pass. Uh, whoa. Uh, uh, I know it's taking a long time to, to do this. Uh, maybe a year or so ago, the, the dates, you know, I was expecting things to be happening this year that are now put off till 2020. And I'm, I'm wondering about the priorities. I, I see that in 2019, in one year, we're going to have Thomasville and, uh, and, and Meredith and these areas, which are quite frankly very low population areas, are going to have service. And maybe that's convenient. Um, but lower, a lower Red Mountain site would probably serve more people sooner, and I'm just I'm assuming there's a physical limitation or a permit thing. You know, you're pushing it out two more years, and I kind of I'd love to know why isn't this a higher priority than say the frying pan? Which apologies to the people at the pan, but there just aren't as many of them. So I can answer the direction that we've been given is um, that we've been working off of is two twofold. Um, number one is public safety. Rudai is there is no public safety up the frying pan, and so that has been a top priority from the direction of this board as well as from our public safety partners. Um, and then two, that while we recognize that there's higher population densities that could bring a higher payback, we've been trying to balance how do we get to those that are unserved, those that have no other option except for potentially a satellite. So. That's how we knew the frying pan has been a high priority there. Um, the reason you're seeing both those sites in 2019 is in working with the Forest Service, we can do a combined application for those two sites, which is a significant lift and a significant um, savings, I guess, not financially, but capacity savings to try and do a Forest Service application in tandem, capacity-wise for us as well as the Forest Service. Um, and then for Lower Red, that is caught up in a conundrum of ownership, to be quite honest right now, with Forest Service applications. It's currently actually managed by American Tower. Uh, we need letters of access, the Forest Service, so to try and get that through. Um, in our conversations with the Forest Service, they've asked that we pace out those two different projects. and. So that's where we've gone with Rudai being our top priority. Got it. I can I can assume to follow up on that. Just to assume that it's not going to be it's not going to get streamlined. So we're this is an uh, an ambitious anticipation anticipated completion. It may not be 2020, and we need to be able to tell people that it might not happen that soon. I also understand looking for the, the final tower, say in East Aspen, and you know it's not not so easy. It hasn't happened. I'm just, I'd love to hear progress on that and. Let Mammoth know that you know we'll help if, if there's some way to help identify locations or introduce you to people. If you're having trouble with outreach, I'd you know love to be an, a resource. Excellent, excellent. Um, George has a question. Yeah, a question or comment. Yeah, I I, I believe that uh, we need to uh, address the unserved uh, first versus the underserved uh, because it is a public safety um, issue. The, uh, the questions I have are on the, um, so if we were to go ahead now and uh, tentatively say let's, let's move this project forward uh, and, and utilize funds from the general fund, uh, that means that the, it's anticipated to be completed within two years versus what you said, John, if we did not, it, the build out could take five to seven years. So it's quite a, quite a difference. And by then, who knows what the technology will do. So I would be supportive of moving ahead now, um, and I agree with Rachel's comments and concerns in terms of seeing how, uh, how the November election goes. My question, though, is um, so now we have Crown completed and Williams completed, and we talked about the ability to, uh, to start to pay back if we utilize the general fund by getting subscribers up. So have we started that process, or where are, where are we in terms of um, trying to get subscribers now as these sites are completed. 
um, so I can speak at the high level and let Evan talk to the next level. That is, we um, are in our third quarter supplementals that you guys saw last week. That is one of the supplemental requests is to purchase those access points mm -hmm. that go up on the towers. So once the supplemental, if it's approved, we can move forward with purchasing those access points and then we'll hand it off to Mammoth to, <laughs> so it, you could probably speak Can, can you just, before you answer that, can, can you explain what, what the access points, what that is and what that means? I'm gonna let Evan okay, answer great. that. <laughs> so just some general terms uh, in, in, in the technology that we're using. So generally speaking, the technology that we're using is considered uh, fixed wireless. And what that means is, you know, our cell phones are mobile wireless. We're walking around with them. Fixed wireless is you have a fixed point. There's a receiver on your house. And that receiver on your house we typically call a subscriber unit. Mm -hmm. And that points up to the top of a tower where it communicates with an access point. So the access point is the, the radio that, that lives up on the tower that enables the communications to occur down to all of the different subscribers. Okay. And the specific <coughs> technologies that we plan to deploy here are using LTE-based signaling, which is um, you know, similar to what we have on our cell phones. It's got some really unique propagation and scheduling capabilities that uh, allow us to uh, load several subscribers on, a, on an access point um, and deliver the types of speeds and services that we've been discussing. So, for example, so right now, <laughs> because I, I, have a, uh, I have a dish in my house for, for the Crown, so I'm already subscribing to um, um, Skybeam, mm -hmm. uh, but there's other um, people in my neighborhood that don't have the direct line of sight to the ground, so they haven't got service yet. So would those be the, the uh, people you would be going after in terms of uh, new subscribers? They, they, they are. So um, there, there are a, a few different frequency bands that we're allowed to utilize for fixed wireless. And one of the big advantages of this LTE platform is that it is uh, a, a non-line of sight technology. It's not gonna shoot through a mountain or anything, but it will go through some trees and some small uh, you know, obstacles and, and it bends a little bit better than a traditional uh, you know, line of sight type technology with that frequency range. So we have um, taken our models, um, and granted these are all computer models uh, from the, the vendors and, and whatnot, and, and that's part of some of these diagrams that we've, we've shown you here. Uh, we've taken all of those models, we've uh, used the, the specific frequencies with the specific antennas that we plan to deploy pointed in the specific directions that we plan to deploy them. And we've, uh, through the help of the, the Pitkin County GIS uh, department, we've overlaid that on address data to come up with uh, potential homes served, and we've used all of that information to then back into a revenue model where we say off the, you know, we expect X number of uh, homes to be hit out of that uh, region. We're anticipating a 20% uh, subscription ratio, and we've used those types of assumptions, it, and I, I feel like most of those assumptions have been conservative to help us develop this entire cost model that then leads us back into what we're talking about, a you know, potential up to seven year payback on um, the, the, the general funds uh, being borrowed. Uh, certainly, the success of this project um, will be in the ability or the, the take rate, so to speak, of, subs of subscribers signing on to the network. If we have a, a greater than expected uh, take rate, that will mean more money coming in. That'll mean uh, you know, quicker payback on the, the general fund uh, allocation um, and vice versa. Um, so there's, you know, going back to the, the work that's been going on over the last year, um, you know, we've been try we've tried to be as analytical and specific as possible with this latest version of the plan, and even taking into in into consideration the phasing. Right, we're we're anticipating these revenues, but only off of these first three sites for this amount of time. When those other sites come online, that's when those revenues are accounted into the cost model. So it's been we, we've got a I don't know twelve page worksheet. We'd be happy to share with you guys with all of this information, but it's. Uh, it, it, it's one more. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. One more question. So again, uh, using the crown as an example, with uh, with the addition of these access points on the crown, will that give you 360 degrees capability? Uh, in in certain areas, we are uh, deploying in a 360 degree pattern. 
Um, I'm trying to think crown might not be 100% 360. There's just a certain area where it just doesn't make sense to spend the money on an access point uh, when there's just no population in that particular direction. Mm -hmm. um, and or that area is covered from another tower that's looking into, mm -hmm. a, say, a valley from a different direction. So uh, we are not doing 360 degree coverage off of each of these sites. It's going to be a much more focused uh, uh, propagation pattern uh, from each of the sites. But I, to clarify, I think where you're coming from, George, is what we are looking is also probably more um, more degrees on the tower than might exist currently today at Crown. So I don't know the specifics of what way Skybeam is pointing, but we are doing it not necessarily of what Skybeam or an existing carrier is doing, but what's going to provide the most coverage throughout, and it's more comprehensive. So there's it, it will cover some of the gaps that might exist today because of how access points are pointed. Yeah, and then to, to Greg's earlier point or question, um, you will be you'll be competitive with Skybeam, and um, hopefully competition will, will bring rates down for everybody. So maybe I should talk a little bit about a, a slight shift and talk about the open access model and, and what that looks like, where we're at today with what we're thinking on, on how this is going to be deployed. So <laughs> I, th I think we've talked in the past about this the concept of an open access model. And, and what we're uh, looking uh, to bring in are multiple service providers that are using the uh, county's infrastructure to provide these services. And uh, the, the, the way that this works is that we have, um, we're going to create wholesale rates for specific service plans that these uh, internet service providers will then be able to turn around and sell to uh, subscribers. And uh, I know originally we had talked about some percentage of revenues and, and uh, you know, dictating that the, the ISPs would charge $70 per month. We've actually gone away from that. And what we're doing is we will set a wholesale rate that will allow an ISP to be profitable uh, as an ISP on this network and sell a $70 uh, service plan. But it's up to them to determine what that uh, pricing package will be. And uh, you know the, the, the concept is that we'll have a handful of ISPs on this network that will be competing on uh, price number one, uh, their, their customer service and the services that they provide, and then also the quality of the bandwidth that they're bringing into the network to then provide out to those subscribers. The, the core network will be, you know, a common element that each of those subscribe, each of those ISPs uses to deliver their services, but they can differentiate themselves among the different providers on, on any of those different factors. So while we, we feel like that $70 mark is probably where is a reasonable uh, package based on some of our, our ideas in terms of how we're pricing the wholesale side, there might be a provider that says, look, I'm going to be the budget provider and I'm going to offer that same package and I'm only going to take, a, you know, I'll take a smaller uh, margin on that and I'll offer it for $60. There might be another provider that says, well, I'm adding in a bunch of additional premium features and premium support. I'm going to charge $90 for that package. We're going to leave that up to the ISPs in the market to determine what that pricing is and we will be the ones dictating the service packages that they have at their disposal to, uh, to provide those services. Um, so it, up here on the, on the screen is just a, a, a general diagram of what that looks like, um, where we're, we're managing those different service providers who then have all of the multiple subscribers. You know, I, got a, I got a line here, so I'm <laughs> um, Steve, then Rachel, then Greg. Let's see, going back to the map, first of all, I noticed there isn't the coverage on Castle Creek, and we will be getting being able to do a tertiary tower there sooner than later that will serve way up Castle Creek, um, and it just the, the map isn't accurate, and it's also not in your time the phasing sheet either. But that probably will happen sooner than later because because of the private fiber optic line going in that we'll have access to. Correct. So the, the coverage analysis that we've modeled that we felt most comfortable with is just off of those primary sites. It's not to say that the secondary, like you said, Castle mm -hmm. Creek, Redstone, some of those areas are not happening just without us knowing specific areas to which directions they point. We just couldn't 
get there until we had the time to actually identify where those locations specifically would be. Then also there, there are some areas where people keep saying we need to have service at Maroon Lake, at Lenado, at Independence Pass, different places for public safety purposes. Um, and so I suggest maybe we should have a phase four. When we get all the other stuff done, there's going to be areas that aren't don't have service. Right. And maybe it would include marble getting a, which is dependent, I know, on the Forest Service action on the tower there. But, but that phase four kind of things would be in the future when we get all the other stuff done, we're already serving 80 or 90 percent of the population, but then, the, you know, there might be things we can do on a further phase in some years down the road probably that would bring in a more, more of the area for either public safety or for getting broadband to specific houses. I think that's part of the plan. I, um, I'm glad you called that out. What we have is what we know best today, but our cost modeling and part of the value of having this revenue share back is that it is investing back so we can keep identifying that it's um, we're not stopping at phase three we know that it will continue to evolve as more sites as more opportunities and that under this funding mechanism uh, and the partnership with mammoth that we can continue to fund in some different elements of it <laughs> okay then also in terms just in terms of the budget i would favor having our general fund um, put, putting money up front to get get the stuff done faster um, the broadband thing is one of our big rocks that we want to mm -hmm. we've been supporting it a bunch we want to keep supporting it so I would favor putting general fund money into that realizing that we have to weigh the funding for a lot of different big rock projects that mm -hmm. when it comes to the actual budget Rachel, please. Yeah, um, thank you. Actually, uh, two two items. Uh, I agree with the open access concept, but I do get a little concerned um, that we are putting taxpayer dollars into producing this system, and if we didn't end up with a discounter, uh, we might have fees that no one really can afford, and the model itself collapses. Um, with no one signing up. Mm -hmm. And so it seems that there, perhaps in the negotiation uh, for the access to use our system, there are at least some side rails or parameters placed on there uh, so that, uh, you know, we're not in a situation where we have to provide the service for people who are uh, not doing it this, you know, in a price gouging, I guess is the best word yeah, to we, say. Yeah, we still are working through the details on that agreement, and we have the ability to put those parameters in there. Okay, that, that's kind of what I was hoping for. Yeah, so, I mean, what I hear you suggesting, Rachel, is um, provide a range, a reasonable range for using the public infrastructure that would allow the differentiation um, that we're talking about, so to go higher or lower, um, to provide value, but not to put a provider in a position to, if they are the only provider, say, going up the frying pan or yeah. such, that um, they'd be able to charge whatever they wanted. Yeah, I, I think there's got to be some ways to look at this, and maybe mm -hmm. others have done more than we are, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. But, uh, you know, whether it's a, uh, quote, profit sharing or, you know, based on your profitability, your your rate is going to be X or your rate is going to be Y of what, what we – I mean, I, I don't know, and I know there's <laughs> rules that constrain these things, but there's got to be a way that we don't have all this taxpayer dollars going into a system and then not have some way to offer guidance towards the outcome and the goal we all had to begin with. So I'll leave it at that. And then the second is just that um, – I keep seeing new articles that I don't fully understand about changes that the FCC is making related to broadband deployment, and um, I saw something recently about, you know, eliminating local government's ability to charge any uh, repayment for popping these things up on government facilities and buildings, and, and I, I know I at least had one community tell me they got caught where they were getting rid of the old building that something was on, and they were told they had to pay to move the Comcast equipment. 
you know, that was on their public building when they were demolishing the building. So um, I, I just will caution it's something we're really going to need to keep an eye on and, and keep ahead of with our federal representatives. And there's even new ones that were just coming out about uh, potential changes to how the money is allocated, and if any money is allocated for broadband employment, doesn't it have to go to the providers first, you know, the, the big boys. So, uh, again, we just need to really stay on top of that. Yeah, and, Rachel, I think those are really well-taken points because it's been a dynamic environment for sure. I think part of where, um, and I'll probably use the wrong term, but where we establish the demarcation about what the county owns and what the county doesn't own helps us manage some of that risk. Good. Thank you. And we have moved that demarcation line because of that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Thank right. you. Greg, please. Yeah. Sorry if I'm a little bit redundant here, but the questions I had were, you know, is it reasonable to assume that a small market or a small fraction of a market will attract multiple ISPs to serve it? Um, and can we mandate that an ISP go into an unprofitable area? You know, Thomasville, I'll, I'll pick on them again today. You know, if, if there are only three people up there who want to subscribe, is the ISP going to bother? And, and will they be competing with another ISP for that small market? And if they don't, you know, how, how will we take care of this constituents? Yeah, I, so a couple points of, of clarification. Any ISP that is a partner on this network will be able to provide services anywhere that this network provides coverage. So there won't be a provider that says, I am just up at Thomasville and I'm, you know, down in Basalt. You, if you're a provider on this network, you get access to everywhere that this network okay. provides coverage. So any, every provider will be competing against the three people in Thomasville for service then, if we had three providers, right? Um, so, so I think that hopefully clarifies that yep. point. Um, the, the good news is that we have also uh, taken some steps to model what ISP profitability would look like as a service provider on this network. And we've come to, uh, we, we've actually uh, put together a model and we've talked to some potential providers already and we have interest from providers uh, to be on this network. Um, so I think that there is a model, there are a number of other um, models across the country where open access networks are becoming more popular. Typically open access networks we're seeing more in the, the fiber to the, you know, fiber-based open access networks. So this is definitely unique in the fact that it's going to be a, a wireless open access network. Um, but we, we've already had interest from several uh, service providers. Um, I've said in the past, and I think that this is a, an important uh, factor, is that we don't oversaturate the network with service providers. If we end up, uh, to your point, this is a limited market, we need to look at what the the total population is and what the total subscriber counts are and, and how many subscribers each access point can, can feasibly service. If we end up with 10 service providers on this network, we're, we're chopping up that pie that, that each of them will not be profitable and it'll probably collapse. So we are looking at implementing a, a, a procedure where an ISP will have to go through some sort of you know approval process and we'll have some sort of limit on the number of ISPs operating on this network to maintain the integrity of the network. Um, and profitability for those service providers. Great, thanks. Uh, George. What sort of contract would they have uh, in terms of length so there's some consistency? Yeah, so I, I, I would imagine that we would be doing um, either a three-year or a five-year contract with the uh, service providers. Uh, these, again, are some of the details that we're working through right now on the, on the specific uh, documents and, and agreements that are, are going to be put together with the parameters on that. But, uh, you know, we want to make sure, and I think part of that vetting process is that the uh, service providers can show, uh, so, you know, some history of being in the business, some financial stability, um, you know, commitment to the area and, you know, longevity. You know, those are the types of factors that I would imagine would be part of that vetting, vetting process to ensure that we get quality providers um, on the network. Any other questions or comments? One last one is just um, net neutrality is always in the news lately, and I'm wondering is is it going to be possible to implement whatever changes? You're, you're being nimble, but I'm, if, mm -hmm. if you could if you talk a little bit about what if net neutrality goes away, and all of a sudden we have got two neighbors and one is getting a, a lot more, paying for a lot more. This system is compatible with that. Is that right? Yeah. So so. 
what we are doing, I, I always use the pipes and water example, right? So we're enabling the plumbing, so to speak, to get the connections out to the, the various uh, individuals throughout the county. Um, the, the, the water or what's being pushed through that will be um, each of the uh, subscribers responsibility on um, you know if they're doing any sort of metering or um, you know throttling on you know specific services and those types of things that is not something that we will control um, certainly since we are in the early phases of, of developing the agreements it would be something that we could easily write into the agreements that uh, the, the the ISPs that we bring into the network uh, adhere to net neutral practices for example if that's something that that is important here uh, that you guys would like it's us worth, to do worth examining um, our from our perspective the network we're building is 100% net neutral we're not there there's no throttling there's no shaping we're not doing anything to uh, you know allow you know competitive access to, to one service versus another that's not our role we're, we're going to be 100% hands off on that um, and that would be up to the the ISPs if they were if there were to be any sort of um, non net neutral practices that would be the ISPs and we could uh, you know handle that up front with uh, contractual language great thanks and I assume we're gonna explore that mm -hmm. So yeah. then just as far as just to wrap up kind of where we are is working on getting the wireless equipment for those first three phases um, then going through the budget process and now the fun part of working through that network operator agreement and then as well as what those ISP kind of template agreements would be so the agreement will actually be directly ISPs will be directly with um, Mammoth as the network operator so it gives them a little bit more flexibility but we'll have a kind of template that we um, check off and then continue to work with Garfield County um, through that revenue share for the lower end of the valley and you know we just had a recent meeting with the Garfield County Commissioners and we thank them for their cooperation ongoing cooperation in, in working through this on a valley-wide effort so hopefully we can come back to that if need be as as the scale of the project grows it's only going to be helpful for attracting oh, yeah. the right ISPs economy I mean the economy of scale is, is going to be yeah. great so and um, do we need to discuss that at today's meeting with Eagle County are we seeing any issues that we might be able to encourage them to participate with us so I mean I, I think it would be worth um, mentioning that it'll be coming right now um, between Garfield County and Picking County we will be developing the network that can serve the whole mid valley right. area and so our thinking at the staff level was for garfield county and picking county to develop the structure um, and then to to invite eagle county to the table be part of an authority or such but they wouldn't need to have any ownership right, right. now possibly capital investment up near root eye um, but that would also be shared for public safety radio so if you will remind me at today's meeting to just mention the broadband efforts and you can chime in with me john if that would be great since we okay. are meeting with them just later today one one last comment at recalling our meeting with garfield commissioners the two that were here were very enthusiastic about a drone based aerial broadband network you know using drones that would stay up for six weeks at a time and I said, well, how soon is this coming? You know, how far down the road is this? And they seem to be very enthusiastic it about it. It was imminent, like tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> but it Have you heard about it? Uh, there are a lot of these, uh, you know, projects in development. I've heard balloons. I've heard drones. I've heard, you know, a number of different things. Uh, you know, I, and, and this may be just my personal opinion, but, you know, we want to be on the leading edge, not on the bleeding edge of technology. And, you know, those types of technologies, while it's a, you know, maybe the, the greatest idea and, you know, in, in five years that might be how we all get our internet services off of drones, the being in the industry, that technology is not, in my mind, developed near enough to, to really consider that as a viable option right. today. It's kind of what we thought, but we didn't, we didn't want to, like. We didn't press them on it. Yeah. We didn't want to totally depress them. I could have a completely different answer in two years. I mean, that's how fast this industry right. is developing, so. 
And, and just a final check in, I think based on the discussion, we got a lot of input and for the purposes of the 2019 budget, we will include a, a basically a financing option to keep this on track for the phases as laid out in the presentation. Okay. Very good. But no drones. Not that yet. we know of. <laughs> we got FAA to worry about enough. We don't need to be throwing drones into the mix. Are there any other issues? I, I think you're seeing support when it comes back for budget, as you know, we have a major but ballot question on that will um, hopefully not affect our budget at the outcome of the election. Um, so we will be bringing it back. And, um, and then we have, I think, uh, second reading for that budget supplemental is probably next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we can be moving forward quickly. And somehow we're, we'll figure out those virtual scissors to cut a virtual ribbon. Okay. <laughs> Lasers. Lasers. You know, there you go. You know, when we did the, the solar panels at the, at the tennis courts coming in across the Moon Creek Bridge, I did go out the night before and take an extension cord and loop it over the solar panels. I didn't plug it in, and I tied it with ribbon and then cut the ribbon, so we were off the grid. Yeah, but I was very careful not to cut a very expensive <laughs> extension cord. <laughs> A, yeah. a massive Tesla coil yeah. is what I recommend, always. All right, anything else from the board on this one? Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. Coming up. Thanks, we appreciate it. So we are going to move on to our review of future agendas. <laughs> and you're, the board will Which be happy. That? I left my future agendas upstairs, so I have no comments. I can talk to you later <laughs> if I do. That's, gonna That's save unusual. Us all kinds of so unusual that I don't have comments um, on future just, agendas. Just a, a few questions. We've got a land use code amendment that Kara and Rye are going to be bringing forward around towers, I believe. Is that? Yeah, this goes to Rachel, you discussing the dramatically and quickly changing landscape at the FCC as it relates to. Um, small cell wireless and 5G. Again, don't ask me to describe what that really means, but that's more based on your cell phone changes rather than fixed wireless. But what you're seeing, um, it passed at the state level last year, and you're just seeing dramatic changes at the FCC from the big carriers of really removing a lot of local control and how those towers are sited. Um, and as a member of the Colorado Communications Utility Alliance, uh, we've gotten a lot of great recommendations and so are working with um, the attorney's office to do a land use code that will help where we can maintain local authority, we'll um, uh, have that amendment to the code. And we're doing it in connection we are working with the city of Aspen as well to make sure they're aligned. So right now, yeah, we're, we're needing to comply with these changes. So we intend to bring code amendments forward in uh, November, I believe, uh, first reading November uh, 7th. Mm -hmm. um, our work sessions are getting really tight because it's also budget period. Do you want us to prioritize um, a work session ahead of that or are you comfortable with us talking about those FCC requirements and code changes? Depends on how lengthy the discussion might be because we don't want to take up a whole regular meeting with an hour and a half of something we might be able to. Well on the other we, side is it, it, would it be one or two chunks. readings because we might be able to break it into chunks. If yeah there, it's a two there's not a lot of discretion code. so there's not a lot of choices in, in front of you guys I think right. is how well, we're Well why don't it. John and I look at the schedule okay. and then we'll see if we can possibly bring it in for a, just a brief work session. If not Rachel's right, right we have two reads. Second read would be our public comment also. Um, it's mandated for land use code right and we had gotten a couple i think steve had also asked about it, so we wanted you one to know it's coming in november and then if we need to make work session time John, we'll, we'll have our work put that on our list okay. okay okay thank you so any other future agendas um just a clarification regular meeting schedule um it is december 5th and december 20th we usually switch those but we had a noticing um we we needed time for proper notice um so we couldn't have the separation of one week, which we originally, I think, had talked about the 5th and the 12th. So it's the 5th. So it is the 5th and the 20th. Well, 20th is a Thursday, 5th and the 19th. Oh, it's in 19th. Yeah, I had the 20th on here, but yeah. Okay. Must be if it's whatever that Wednesday I'll come is. on the 20th if you want. <laughs> <laughs> but the 5th and the 19th. Oh, yeah, I did have it on the 20th on mine. I don't know. I have it down. 
Well, it then, must have I mean, been on our schedule for the 20th because I have it on the 20th on my calendar. Yeah, no, I had double checked yesterday just because I'm trying Can we to look at we'll look into that, John, and see if maybe it. it yep. I have it down yeah, on the 19th is, online. It is, so. it is showing up on mine as the 20th, too, right now, which is the Thursday. So let me let me double check that. Okay. I'm going to take it off on the 20th because I don't think it's going to count that day. <laughs> that's, that's not going to happen. Um, while Kara's here, I just, <laughs> if I could jump in to mention that at the CCI meeting on Friday, Eric Bergman talked about our broadband thing as possibly being uh, something that could be put into the policy statement. And so I'm hoping you can work with him on that. I will be going to the meeting next Friday, but I'm okay. gone uh, over the next five days and won't have okay. a chance to do anything with it. I'll connect with him. Okay, thank you. All right, all right great. That's all. Any other future agendas? Not for me, no. Rachel? Um, I am just putting it out there. I'm not sure what's really going to happen here, but uh, we have a work session now scheduled for November, Thursday the 29th, and right. I know why, because of the holidays and everything like that. Um, I'm just looking at my schedule where I'm at CCI through Wednesday afternoon, and then uh, back in Pueblo for a Friday meeting. Uh, so I'm kind of thinking about I may not make the meeting of the 29th. It'll all depend on what's on the agenda. And I think most of it is a budget job. Yeah. So we'll, we'll take a look. I'll see how it's going. But I just kind of want to put that out there as a meeting. You're not trying to get out of a budget meeting. Are no, you? no, it's not that. But <laughs> I am. I am. I'm trying to get out of driving back from <laughs> Pueblo and then back to Pueblo within the same 24 no, just hours. Kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> all right. Anything else on future agendas? No? Okay, we're going to move to open discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, and I, I may ask, uh, Rachel and Steve may have better background on this, but there have been uh, proposals made by the Gallagher Interim Committee. Okay. Um, and there's a number of them. I will hand them out here. Alex, you could. Alex, come, come on, on up. up come on up. Come on up. Yeah, you could, yeah so and you. Alex could actually cover this. And I, also, while John's passing this out, I want the board to know Greg will be in charge next week. <laughs> I will be sitting in the rain in Mexico. <laughs> so uh, Kara kind of gave me the rundown on this, and I can set a little background to it. So Alex Sanchez with the manager's office. Um, one of our uh, legislative items we submitted to CCI was the Gallagher Amendment. Um, and there has been the um, interim Gallagher Committee going on through the summer. They can recommend five bills to the uh, should be moved on. Um, their final meeting is tomorrow, uh, so staff is looking for direction on if there are any you'd like to support or oppose. Um, and then I can also go into some of the bills at kind of a high level that uh, Kara had mentioned to me earlier. And of course, the turnaround is uh, tomorrow. John, how, how's, how's bill number four about the fire? How's that going to affect their current ballot question? Do we know? Um, we do not know. I have not looked at their the specific language of their ballot question. I believe it's tied, though. My understanding was it was tied to um, revenues lost as a result of Gallagher. And uh, I think depending specifically how that language is written, um, you know, if they're backfilled, maybe the mill levy doesn't go up, uh, but I'm not really prepared to answer that question yeah. for sure. As, as I understand it, any of these are just to make them whole on current budgets that would be reduced by the assessment. So it's my belief that the fire district is asking for new revenues for new purposes. And so this would be all fire districts, certainly not just ours. Right, yeah, I understand. But I, don't, I, but I don't think it would affect their their question depending on how it was written over time in, in terms of their collections. Well, that's what I'm wondering is if they wrote anything into their current ballot question that would backfill their old. We, we would need to look at that. I, yeah. I believe Basalt is running a ballot question that is a Gallagher backfill. And so that would probably be affected. I would assume that um, Aspen Fire Protection District, District is similarly yeah. And trying Carbondale to provide too. a protection for Gallagher Carbondale's decreases. Too, so. yeah. yeah. You know, just to, 
for information, you know, any of these bills requesting that the state backfill is subject to, you know, the state general fund, legislative priorities, whether they care or not. And it's a huge number. You know, this is fire districts across the state. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, you know, potential library districts across the state. And uh, from the Gallagher reassessments, they're going to have school districts across the state that they need to backfill already just to comply with Amendment 23. So, you know, these might be bills that come out of the committee, but whether there be any money for them in the state general fund is totally a different question. We've tried to run bills for um, uh, historic courthouse funding instead of all being on the county's backs, and that's gone nowhere. We've been running bills for public defenders, uh, excuse me, not public defenders, district attorney's offices to have more state support. They've gone nowhere. So. You know, uh, I just, uh, I, I see them as, well, hey, that's great. Somebody's going to um, backfill out of the state general fund pot so that they don't have to deal with the greater Gallagher questions. And what will they backfill in another three years, 25%? You know, I mean, it just, it, it's, it's a stopgap perhaps to save some budgets on some places, but only until a Gallagher fix occurs. Um, so, you know, I think what we're starting to see is all these kind of D. Gallagher questions coming up from groups as one-offs across the state as opposed to one bigger fix. Um, so that's unfortunate. And uh, a little teeny bit more background. CCI has asked, are there any of these that you guys want us as counties to say we really all endorse this or we really all don't like this? But it, it, it's not, I'm not sure how much impact we'll have on the actual committee. And it's not like we're making final choices. This is just what they've been coming up with. They have their own uh, motives and concerns uh, separate from what counties and cities and special districts have been presenting. So um, I just wanted to put that out there that, you know, it's still fomating. Best said. So, so on this list, though, bill, prop, uh, bill number two, the property tax classification for short-term rental units, um, that's something that doesn't backfill. So it would just be something that the counties would be able to do when property tax assessments. So that one doesn't sound like such a bad idea. That, that would be a, um, a statewide change. Right. And the main thing is that it changes that ratio of how much commercial there is to residential. And so by changing the, the ratio of how many commercial properties are in the state. Uh, now it, that's, that's two about short term rentals? Yes, because by changing the classification, right now they're all part of the, the residential inventory. They'd be taken out of the residential inventory and thrown over into the commercial inventory so that they would be right. carrying more of the share. It, it's only still, it's a temporary thing. It just readjusts a, a, yeah. a ratio. But over time, you would start to see potentially the changes so, again. So, Patty, how, how Gallagher <laughs> requires a constant ratio be right, right, between right. But the I just commercial don't see and residential. The way it's written here how that fits to the, because there's nothing about commercial in here at all. Well, it's so a what? Statement. Right, right. No, you're right. And But what would happen is the short term rentals would be pulled out of the residential and value. And so the commercial wouldn't be as impact, wouldn't be impacted as much. So you're, you're, residential rate wouldn't drop as much because that value is a little bit lower. Rachel's right, it's temporary because as construction continues, you know, if, if residential continues to be built and valued at a quicker w rate than commercial, we'll eventually catch back up to where we are today. Well, when it says fiscal impact estimates a 5 to 10 percent change in Pitkin County's 2020 assessed value, that means we'd be having more value coming in on the commercial level than residential? Because we'd have pro pro more properties. That's correct, because you'd have residential the, properties that are previously assessed right. at the residential rate. And the commercial, commercial. rate is a little higher. Correct. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But depending on what property tax is in Picking County, the actual collection might decrease. You know, unless a, a mill levy was de uh, which I think Open Space and Trails is. That you know, it would even if the assessed value went up, you still can only collect so much because of Fenton Amendment and right, right, right. Tabor. I'm, I'm just talking about the classification yeah. of property. Yeah, you know, no, and and I understand, and, and I'm, I'm sorry. There's just so many side details to this. This affects the state's averages because the state is the one who averages all commercial and all residential. It's not 
as it should by be, county. perhaps average regionally or average by county. But uh, the real mess we're starting to get into is the poor uh, assessors and uh, treasurers are going to have different mill levy collection rates for different um, entities if they've kind of, quote, de -bruced and they can still collect the same revenue. It's just uh, assessors and, and those folks are going to start having nightmares with every taxing district having a different rate and right, collection. Right, right, right. So does the board want to support or not support any of these? Are we so totally confused now we don't really know what we're doing anyway? Yeah, I'm pretty confused, to tell you the truth, to try to make a quick decision. Yeah, That's they're it. just asking if people wanted to weigh in before that interim committee discusses them further tomorrow. Yeah, yeah my understanding is they're, they'll be picking five to, or right. a maximum of five to move forward. Repealing the Gallagher Amendment is probably not going to happen. It's such a heavy lift, but depending on the outcome of the election in November, it, that might change the mm -hmm. scenario there. Are there I any that... The one that would benefit us the most would be the reclassifying the short-term rental units. Are there any that the board would look at and say, you know, given that they're looking for five, and, and again, we've just got a short time where yeah, we've no, had we this. Yeah, we actually have two minutes. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I, I'm, uh, that's why I brought up the short-term rental okay. one, but Rachel's explanation only further confused me. So I'm not comfortable moving any of these, and I don't have enough information before me, but if there's other members of the board that are comfortable. Yeah. Um, yeah, please. Thank you. I, I, I'm fine not moving any forward either. You know, I realize it's a complex subject, and, and no. it's still just – in the sausage making process at best if anything actually comes out i think we're all going to be surprised uh, but i would like to point out there really has been some strong support on bill number two on the reclassification and it's for several reasons mostly that uh well not mostly but one of the main ones is how the short-term rentals have affected the affordable housing market in every community and the ability and their the communities are seeing properties bought to be short-term rentals period as an investment and um, people are going well wait a second that's right across the street from a little bed and breakfast that's paying a 30 percent commercial rate and here you have a property that's seeing 40 different sets of visitors over 45 weeks a year and they're paying a residential rate you know so there, there's equity questions that people are really starting to feel are very strong about this and it's also changing the nature of neighborhoods really radically where you used to have a neighbor and now you have a party every Friday night with different guests who've come in and homes that have a sewer system or septic tank set up for four people and they're housing 10 every week and you know so people are really feeling strongly that the whole air nib rvo whatever the initials are have has ha, is just a, a new beast on the horizon that no one our old tax system didn't even begin to anticipate but the equity issues for lodging properties is it's just you know catastrophic so anyhow i just wanted to say there's there's a lot of reasons behind bill two as opposed to just gallagher fix that's why i brought bill two up off the yeah. list yeah. so yeah so, um, yes, thank so, you, Alex. Yeah, just to be clear, no positions of support or opposition to any of them. And, and we're sorry we did we just did not okay. have more lead time okay. to bring this to you guys. So. Jenny just asked us for it yesterday, yeah. you know, basically. It was when yeah. I got so the So did, any other open discussion? I just, uh, real quick, um, we had uh, 40 families apply for the nine homes in the phase one of I our heard. Basalt Vista project and so that's split between the school district and the county so they're going through the uh, qualification process on on those now but it really does speak excited. to the demand and so the phase one is, is, is nine homes and then is it nine homes nine homes nine homes is how they're doing over the next three years or yeah that's how we're we're phasing it out over three phases we we went ahead and allowed the the school district has um, the majority we've got three in this first phase they have six and then we're going to uh, reverse it, but um, we have plenty of interest in the in the right. we're excited. project. People so. are excited. In and that's area. all I had for you. Uh, any other open discussion from the board? Uh, yes, just because yes. we're on TV, I'm going to remind everyone to check their voter registration address with the clerk's office on pickandvotes.org or get registered if you've newly moved into our community. It's time to be ready to vote in November.
Thank you. And I will add, your ballots come out on October the 15th. If you don't receive one by the end of that week, please come into the clerk's office or check and change your address on pickandvotes.com um, so you can receive a ballot. It's really critical that people get out and vote. And one last thing, Rachel Richards is leaving today to go to her class reunion. <laughs> yes. and High school. Her high school class reunion, and she will be celebrating her birthday on the 6th, I believe. 10th or 15th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so it's, we have <laughs> goodies over here for the board. Let's pass those around. And we, we, yeah. okay, happy birthday, Rachel. Candy. And grassroots. Thank you. Thank you. The board will be leaving from here after lunch. We're heading to a joint meeting um, at, in Elgibel at um, the Basal, or the Eagle County Building. Mm -hmm. And um, so we will not be back for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, grassroots. Thank you, board. I have a question. Um, travel. We have a car. Who needs a ride? I am not going. You're not going because you're not going to the meeting. You're not going to the meeting. You're going to the meeting. Here we go. I'm going, but I think I'm going to drive. I have to deliver a vehicle then. Okay. You need a ride? I'll, I'll ride down with you, and then I, my car is at Old Snow Mess, and on the way back, then okay. I'll get off. Because I have to be back up here by 6 o'clock for a homeowners association meeting in North 40. If I could drop a, if you wouldn't mind dropping me off at the Anderson Park, that'd be great. Or I'll drop, I will drop you off. No, I will pick you. I will pick you up after you drop <laughs> off. Yes. All right, great. So we got it covered, and I will pick up the car. And what time are we heading out? Um, I don't know, quarter to. We have to drop you off and pick you. No, pick you up after you drop.